think about in species invasions as in, you know, in several different stages, first species arrive and they're introduced, and then some of those species become established or naturalized, and then a few of those species go on to spread and become invasive. This is a filtering process where the results are many species that start out, and there's a few species that become invasive at the end. And when I'm talking about invasion throughout the rest of this talk, I'm really going to be focusing on this intermediate and establishment phase and asking what prevents or allows some species to become established at the very end. And so questions about how we can use phylogenetic information to predict these patterns go back to Charles Darwin, who thought that you could use relatedness between species that are native in the environment and species that are becoming introduced in order to determine whether those species will become naturalized or not. And you can do this because you would expect that closely related species share similar niches, and so they all have similar aerobic environments that favor them, and also similar types of species interactions that will affect their success. Now this becomes a conundrum as was discussed in the first talk in the session, because depending on the type of environment that you're looking at, you could expect different patterns think about the aerobic environment, the positive interactions of nucleus or resource species, then you expect that phylogenetic relatedness should favor naturalization. You should see some pattern like this, where closely related species that are you know, not very diverse are going to have a high probability of becoming established, and as diversification and divergence continues, there's going to be a lot or smaller chance of establishment. But then when you start thinking about other kinds of interactions with biotic resistance or competitive interactions or interactions with natural enemies, then you should expect that there's going to be the opposite relationship where phylogenetic relatedness should be disfavoring naturalization. And so those closely related species are going to have a lot of competition, especially with those close relatives that are in the environment already, and they may be attacked a lot by the natural enemies of their closely related species. Whereas if they diverge more, then they're going to be freer from those negative interactions. And so just to look at that conundrum again, you can see that there are two really opposite patterns that could be predicted when you're trying to look at the effect of phylogeny on establishment. And so for the information that was available to Darwin at the time, it looked like the evidence was really supporting that biotic resistance scenario. And so competition is probably the most important thing. That was called uh, Darwin's naturalization hypothesis. And since Darwin, there have been quite a few tests of this pattern. So you can see here is a summary for these two studies. And the important thing to focus on is the last column on the right. Where you can see that there are different effects of ovocysteine. So negative effects at seroptimumcine in red but also some studies have found positive effects of relatives on establishment in blue, and a couple of studies have found that there's no consistent pattern. However, there has been really not much testing about whether Darwin's assumptions to begin with are actually correct until recently in Levine in 2010. And so to show you, this is the main assumption that Darwin's making and has been made since then, is that you expect that biotic resistance and facilitation are both weakening with phylogenetic resistance. And there are actually two components of this assumption. The first is that there's a negative relationship between phenotypic distance and species interaction strengths. And so as phenotypes are similar, then there's going to be a strong interaction. And as phenotypes become more dissimilar, there's going to be a weaker interaction. And second, that there's a positive relationship between phenotypic distance and phylogenetic distance. And so there's been some questions recently about whether we expect the second uh, case to be true. So I'm focusing mostly uh, for the rest of the talk on that first assumption, so that my lighting's not quite working. Um, but looking at what kind of interaction we expect to see between phenotypic distance and the strength of interaction. And so while it seems like Darwin and a lot of people are focusing on what is scenario called phenotype matching, there are actually two different ways that interactions can work. And they can work in these different types of ecological interactions, so just going through each of them. For competition, when you think about phenotype matching, you usually think about species that are using one resource, and so they're suffering a lot of competition, and so one solution to that is for character displacement, so diverting some to different resources, and 
the tribe has attempted to come in more dissimilar, and that reduces competition. Tribal region also has competition that uh, leads to an arms race, and so if three is competing for life, then it doesn't matter how similar the traits are, what matters is who has the more extreme traits and which tree is taller. And so that has interactions working in a very different way. We see the same kinds of differences in mutualism, where there are two different Optus butterflies and they've converged on one phenotype. But you can also have interactions between mutualists where there's another arms race and there's a difference in their arms race, where the flower does better by having a long spur, forcing the pollinator to come in close to pollinate, but the pollinator does better but has a really long tongue and is able to collect a lot of nectar. So there's consumer resource, predator prey, host parasite interactions. You can also see two different mechanisms at play. For example, with cuckoos and their hosts, then there's going to be a chase in egg phenotype. And so the cuckoo does best if its egg matches the host, and the host does best if it mismatches. And once again, you can also see that arms races are possible. Here, toxic prey is better, it's more toxic than the, the predator can detoxify, and the predator does better if it can, is better at detoxification. And so it's interesting in looking at these different scenarios in a model and seeing what they say about what determines establishment probability. And so first, looking at divergence time, when you treat as the proxy for or sorry, phylogenetic diversification. Then the type of community, so whether we're looking at a community of competitors or mutualists, consumers and resource species. And finally, looking at those different mechanisms of trade interactions, the phenotype matching and the phenotype differences. So just to illustrate this a bit more, think about two species on an island, A and B, that are interacting in some way, perhaps as competitors, and they co-evolve for a certain period of time, T. After that period of time, a new species is introduced, so here we have a new tilde, and it starts interacting with both of the species on the island. And what's important is that the later that it arrives, the more it's diverged from its closely related species, B, which is on the island. And so we can look at what the effect is of the length of convolution and the amount of divergence. And so I apologize, there's actually a conversion error that has made the map even more difficult to follow than it might otherwise be. Uh, but what's important here is that we use the quantitative genetics model, which is the standard model that's been most difficult to this year, where we're following the change in the mean phenotype, so the first depiction of species A, and that depends on the amount of additive genetic variance divided by the mean uh, fitness of species. You multiply that by the change in the mean fitness with the change in the mean phenotype. And so this allows us to track how the mean phenotype is changing over time in each of the resident species. And we incorporated those two different interaction mechanisms, so the phenotype matching and the phenotype differences in the species fitness those are in those equations. And so here you can see on the x-axis the phenotype distance, the difference between the phenotypes of those two species, A and B, and its effect on the fitness of the total species. <coughs> and so those top curves representing the case where you have something like uh, character displacement, and the bottom row shows you what leads to an arms race, and what What's important to look at is what happens when you have matching phenotype or the same phenotype value. So when the difference between the phenotypes is zero, then in the top row you have that maximum effect on fitness. But in the bottom row, where you actually have the maximum effect on fitness of the species <coughs> interaction is when there's high amounts of difference in the phenotypes. So this is an example now of what you see with the coevolutionary dynamics. So this is a case with competition and an arms race. And what you see is that uh, the phenotypes of the two resin species, blue and green, are shown over time and they're increasing uh, because both <coughs> species do better if they have a more extreme phenotype. 
And so then we're also interested in what happens when that new species is introduced. And so we find the probability that it becomes established, which is just one minus probability going extinct. This depends on the initial population size and the thickness of that introduced species. And what you can see is <coughs> as the rise rate goes in, off goes on, then actually the introduced species has a lower and lower chance of becoming established, which has fallen very far behind in the uncertainty. And so we have kind of this little result bonus, I'm just going to show you now the results from individual based simulation in which we're able to draw parameter values from random distributions. And so this is now uh, shows that the results are very robust. And what you can see on the x axis now is the version time. And on the y axis, the volume graph, the change in probability of establishment of that introduced species. And so when you see red dots, that means there's been an increase in establishment probability, and blue dots means a decrease in establishment probability. And what's important here is that the community, with other competitors, the mutualist, the consumer resource, as well as determining the different rows, doesn't have much of an effect at all on that relationship between phylogenetic distance and establishment probability. What really matters is the interaction mechanism that's underlying coexistence and so whenever we had a case of gene type matching, regardless of the community type, we saw an increase in establishment probability uh, with phylogenetic distance. And we saw the reverse, a decrease in establishment probability with phylogenetic distance whenever there were gene type differences underlying the interaction. And so we see the same patterns that were predicted in Darwin's natural distinction conundrum, but actually instead of them depending on the kinds of interactions, we're showing that it really matters the interactions or, or the mechanisms underlying the interactions. And so the implications of this are that we can still use phylogenetic information to predict patterns of invasion and also to explain patterns of invasion, but we need to pay much more attention to the mechanisms that are underlying interactions, and we probably need to gather much more information about how common these two different me mechanisms are. And so I'll do this quickly, but you can see more details in the public paper. And with that, well, thank you, and thanks to my funding sources. Another question? 